a couple of things woke me up. One was a client that said to me, um, you're, a, you're a fantastic vet, but you're a shit of a person. <laughs> From Hamster Wheel Publishing, this is Blunt Dissection. I'm Dr. Dave Nicholl. Today's episode features Aussie business legend Dr. Dick Gelderman. We go deep into his career, which took him from happy times carrying cows in the Australian Hunter Valley to the point where he almost lost everything and how he rebuilt his life to become one of the world's foremost vet business leaders. Prepare for an epic story of struggle, survival, and eventually success. Dear Rick Gelderman, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you on. Dr. Nickel, fantastic to be here. Nice to uh, chat again. It is. I'm, um, I'm excited for us to talk today. Um, over... Like all the times I've listened to you, I learned something um, profound, uh, useful, impactful, and um, and your passion for your work has always been very obvious and is incredibly infectious. So I'm excited. It's podcast. It's number one. It's the first podcast ah. on the hamster wheel. So you have the the distinguished awesome. honour. So which also means if we make a terrible mess of it, we've got an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for 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 being for me being the first one, and thank you for those uh, those kind words. <laughs> no, abs- absolutely, well, that's cool. Maybe that's a good maybe that's a good start point. Um, and maybe because it's the first one, maybe I just briefly explain what the purpose of the podcasts are that I'm going to be doing. Um, effectively, I'm I'm connecting with people who have done something cool, amazing, impactful, change the world around them a little bit within the veterinary sphere to try and really get under the skin and find out a little bit more about what ticks and what lessons we can sort of take away for, you know, for us mere mortals um, consumption so as we can sort of maybe progress and and, and, and achieve more um, by learning from, from people like um, Diedrich. So that's the sort of premise of the podcast. And... Um, I guess that sort of leads very nicely into uh, question one, Derek, which is what separates, in your mind, what separates uh, you know, a, a good veterinary practice, um, and maybe I'm being kind, maybe I should set the bar lower, what, what separates a, you know, a normal veterinary practice from a really good or a, a great veterinary practice? Well, the the first thing I think that people listening would think that it's the quality of of the medicine and the standards of care and I'm going to say there's probably nothing further from the truth um, because I I, I think our industry has excellent standards of care and everyone you know meets the the minimum requirement the the difference is uh, the prime difference is leadership if you don't have uh, an, an effective leader in the practice a passionate leader with 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 purpose and a why and and if that person, if if you don't, if you have that person, then then he or she inspires everyone to come to work, do their best, um, uh, you know, do do awesome things uh, with respect to the to the patients and the and, and the clients. And if you if you don't have that leader, then um, nothing works. It doesn't matter what quality of equipment you have, or how fantastic the premises, or how uh, schmick the website. You know, it it all comes down to to an inspiring leader, you know, and. And, and you, uh, I think you're interviewing people that, with respect, in inverted commas, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, um, you know, make a dent in the veterinary universe, you know, to paraphrase Steve Jobs. And, and I think great veterinary leaders do that. They make a dent in their, in their practice and in their local area and inspire everyone. So leadership, I think one of the challenges often people have with leadership is that it's one of these concepts that's bandied around and talked about and still somehow remains somewhat nebulous as to okay, what what does that look like what does that do can you go deeper on on what you know what what a version of good leadership is in your eyes well i can talk personally from what a excuse me crap leader is and <laughs> and i was one of those uh a long time ago, you know, the the classic, you know, sea, seagull leader, you know, come in, yell, scream, scream, had terrible leadership skills and a revolving door of, of uh, staff. And um, interestingly, a, a couple of things woke me up. One was a client that said to me, um, you're, a, you're a fantastic vet, but you're a shit of a person. <laughs> Ouch. And 
Yeah, yeah. Well, he was a really good client and, and very honest. Had greyhounds, and uh, uh, he was one of my first ever clients. And and when you know someone says that to you, then then um, I guess you start to uh, you know change things. And and you know my attitude is if if I can change from from what I was, um, then then anybody can. And if I can develop leadership skills, and, and I think I'm now. A, 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 a good leader, uh, and trying to improve all the time, but but leadership is, and I guess it gets back. And and you and I have both read the books, and and you know servant leadership, where mm. where you are there to serve other other people, and 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 that's your team members, and then hopefully they will serve, you know, the clients. It's an upside down pyramid with the leader being at the bottom serving everyone above them and that triangle gets wider as you you know go up as it were so you're supporting the team and the team supports the 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 patients and the clients and you know leadership is about um you know doing the right thing even when it's hard to do so it's about having a vision inspiring everyone with that vision um as you said Dave, it's it's such a deep subject. I I could go on about it for hours, literally. Well, maybe attacking it from, and uh, maybe I'll hold you to that. <laughs> you just invited yourself for a for a round two there, almost unwittingly. Um, where are we at in in your experience? You know, you've you've consulted and coached in Australia, in the US, in Europe, South Africa. Um, what's the where are we at? If you had to benchmark us, you know, we're like ten was we're really crushing it on the leadership front as a as a as a profession, and I'm and I'm thinking more about you know within the clinically active side of things, so in small animals, large animals, equine. Yep. yep. Um, uh, where are we at? Where ten is we're crushing it, and you know, one is you know, oh my god, like there's none. There's none in evidence. Where are we at? Where are you seeing? And and what are your reasons for for what do you think the reasons are for what you've observed? The practices that you and I see that that do well have have leadership that's up at eight, nine, or or ten. Um, the bulk of practices, unfortunately, the leadership's down at one or two, or, or in in some cases maybe zero. And the reason is that you know when when we go to vet school, we are um, combative almost. I mean, uh, there's a certain number of us are going to pass and a certain number are going to fail. We're not, uh, we're not trying to be collaborative or to help each other. It's, it's, um, you know, dog eat dog almost. Yeah. And, and a lot of us go into vet school wanting to do the best by patients, but we don't understand that, that animals come attached to the patients. Um, you know, a lot of us would probably like to have a piece of string going through the door and, um, you know, reel that piece of string in with a piece of history from the um, from the owner and the pet coming through the trap door. Yeah. Um, it's so that we didn't have to face up to the clients, and and yeah. and that's one aspect. And then the other aspect, of course, is is the fact that we all of a sudden have to deal with with as well as dealing with clients, we then have to deal with 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 people in our workplace, a- and even a in inverted commas, you know, normal vet or a normal nurse or a normal receptionist needs to be a leader. They need to lead the clients um, up their belief system path. They need to sell ideas and sell concepts on 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 whatever pet care is appropriate or horse care or cattle care is appropriate. Um, you know, for that, for that, for that patient, for the, for that practice. You know, within the constraints and the belief systems of of the owner and the budgets of the owner. So, I believe that we're all leaders and we all need to be leaders. And unfortunately, that's very deficient uh, in in almost every practice. And then at a, a higher level, the practice needs a leader to, you know, set the vision and 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 you know draw everyone towards that vision and unfortunately the the vet that ends up owning the practice never ever thought they uh, they never even considered that they needed to be a leader and, and they they don't have the skills um they've got no idea how to do it if they were trained and if there was someone there to help them um, uh, th- these things are learned skills i mean we we used to think that leadership is you know you're born with it it's a in inverted commas god given gift no right. it's a it's a trained skill and, and yes some are innately better at it than others but everyone can learn it so what are the what are the keys to being a good leader like you so there are there are clearly people like is it are people who are seen to be a good leader 
the ones who just are happy, like the more extrovert types that are, you know, they're they're just in people's faces more, or or how like what are the actual keys? Like what 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 are the attributes that people can uh, fashion or, or work on and develop to improve that? It's it's uh, it's a hard question to answer, but I believe it's uh, and I'll uh, I'll say it again. I've said it a couple of times. It's having that passion about. Um, patient care, client care, what, whatever it happens to be, you know, being passionate about something and then uh, uh, wanting to take uh, your team with you and, and the patients and the clients with you on that journey um, and then being able to communicate that um, and that communication skill is is hugely important and, and again, it's something that, that you and I, um, I guess, work out, practice, uh, those sorts of things, but it's a lot of people that... that um, are not in our situation that haven't had to develop it, um, you know, don't know how to do it. And, and it's scary. I, I certainly remember being a very, very, very poor communicator. Um, I, I, you know, did lots of training, lots of courses, just like, like you have, and, yep. and um, y- you can develop it. So, so it's, it's a matter of, yes, there's some innateness to leadership. There's a, a lot of learned stuff. Um, and then engaging the team and engaging the clients. I, I hope I've answered the question. Well, I'm. I would love to relate it back to your journey because you you've got a very um, fascinating and and I think rich journey, <laughs> which is one of the you know obviously you have a you have a, a great brain for all of this stuff and and you articulate it very very well. But what what almost what brings it to life more is when you put it into the context of. You know your personal journey, because um, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like you've had some real aha moments as you've gone through. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm, and I'm gonna slightly change tack on this a little bit and go. So let's take it back and maybe walk the journey um, and go. Is you, it's safe to say you made an unusual choice when you first came out of of vet college, right? <laughs> well, like, I uh, not, not entirely yeah, I, the normal path. No, I um, I graduated and bought a practice the day I graduated. Um, <laughs> so okay, as, as, the, uh, just as you yeah, do, it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and the senior bed in the practice had graduated the year before, so there were two of us, <laughs> a new graduate and a uh, well, a, a, a new, new, new graduate and a new graduate, and um, yeah, we mumbled al- we bumbled along, um, not knowing how bad we we were, but. Um, and look, we didn't make any money and I had to go and teach, um, you know, uh, night college or whatever you want to call it, TAFE in Australia, um, to, to make ends meet. Um, I taught in the butchery school. I taught meat inspection at the butchery school. <laughs> so I, yeah, we so, came out as, we came out as, uh, as, as, uh, graduated, uh, meat inspectors, if you like. So, right, uh, right. I mean that's, yeah. that's so. There's, there's, you know, there's, you look at that and you think that's just something bonkers about a profession. On one hand, you're there to f- fix one set of animals, and the other hand, you're there chopping up other. Pets. It's just, um, there's, I'm sure there's lots of jokes about you know veterinary practices next to restaurants and you know pure <laughs> meat supply, which we probably won't even go near. I'm fascinated. What propelled you? What, what was your motivation into making that? decision like what were the what were the the journey points along your life up until that point that when you 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 got to the end of five years of entry college and you thought you know because the normal i work with a lot of new graduates and it's you know there's such a massive fear factor now even of getting in the exam room for that first time um to go from you know to look at things from that perspective to the the deidre gelderman i'm i'm just going to go buy my own place um <laughs> talk me through what, what the thought processes were and the journey up to that point that, that made that decision real for you look it was i never wanted to do it as it were it wasn't a conscious decision my, we had a horse start or my parents had a horse start and and alan mctackett the uh, the gentleman that uh did the vet work for our horse stud was the guy that I bought the practice from. And I did prac work with him in, you know, third, fourth, fifth year as you do. And, and it was just an accepted fact that he wanted to retire and he was going to walk out the day I graduated and I was going to walk in. Um, and and look, I I wanted to go to the UK and practice and do the two years over there that all the Australians do, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it never eventuated. So, um, but it, it was just, you know, I bought the practice, 
for ten thousand dollars, and I bought the house for forty thousand um, dollars, and had to have my parents, my my father's best friend, um, uh, collateralized or whatever the word is, um, money to the bank. I, we obviously had no money. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how it, there was no thought process involved, though. <laughs> Um, and I mean, I, I, the obvious question to go to, and I don't think we should go there just yet, is would, would you do the same thing again? But maybe we'll come back to that. Um, so, so you move from there to, to look. Let's go on the journey there a little bit, because so initially you're working your 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 butt off and mm-hmm. not making any money. Um, and you're working the meat, the meat inspection thing on the on the other side of it. Um, how does the journey go from there? Because you know, this is this is seventy seven, right? Nineteen seventy seven. That, that yeah, seventy seven. I started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was really, really am- ambitious, and I could also see the industry changing. So our isolation kennels were the were the carport or the garage, whatever you want to call it. The carport was. Um, was air conditioned the house wasn't um, you know we had we had dogs in cages next yep. to the bed and cats uh, you know with drip stands and all those sort of things we had uh, foals in the living room uh, and literally I'm, I'm being 100% serious and yep. I didn't want that sort of lifestyle anymore and I could see that the board of fit surgeons probably wasn't going to approve of that for very much longer so um, I wanted to build a practice and I wanted to build a stainless steel super practice and yep. um and so I went and did that, and um, that was a mistake. I should retrospectively, um, at least initially, we made a lot more money um, out of that house practice. I should have, you know, just bought a house and converted it, or yeah. converted that house, or whatever, yeah. rather than, you know, because we went from, we went from, you know, two vets, a, a nurse, and a receptionist to needing to have three receptionists on the reception counter at the new place that was so big. We lost uh, $225,000 in the first two years, but we didn't know it till two years in because our book work was that slack. And then when I went to get some extra money, and, and this is a really defining moment, I, I remember sitting in the, in, the, in the bank manager's office and he said to me, he looked me in the eye and he said to me, um, you vets are all like a bunch of donkeys. You'll work all day for a carrot. <laughs> and yeah, and that was that was my line in the sand. Um, a little while after that, uh, I had a, a breakdown, had a nervous breakdown, suicide attempt. It's all well um, yep. uh, publicised and documented. And I said, no more, enough is enough. I'll either fix it uh, or I'll or I'll get out. And I gave myself uh, uh, just on two years. And uh, I decided I was a, an excellent vet, but knew nothing about anything else. Yep. And so started getting coaching, and and that was where things started to change. Okay, so the in, so you, you know you went through from 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 seventy seven the you know you started up you'd gone as and you graduate. What were the give me you know maybe your top? I'd love to chunk this down into you know five year sections from seventy seven through to, and maybe that's that's too short a time period. But what were your big takeaways? You, know, you basically had two decades doing it before before you hit the new build, and that's yep. that's like a huge intersection in in life right there. But in the in the in your development to getting to the point of going right, the goats in the living room and you know, yep. <laughs> sleeping with yep. donkeys uh, or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> or, or that's not cool anymore. What is um, if certain things come out of your mouth you just hadn't said <laughs> and, and you should probably edit out I'll probably leave it in for amusement's sake um, <laughs> what you know for, for that first what were the big important takeaways that you can remember or recall thinking yeah that's so a, a couple of things it was a really fun life um, you know it was a mixed animal practice I remember again literally doing carvings uh, in on an island in a river um, you know, had to had to walk through chest deep water to do a carving, and the real James Herriot stuff. You know, getting paid with pumpkins, and <laughs> and and it was it was it was fun. Um, yep. It was rewarding. It was exciting. People loved you. Um, it was a good lifestyle. You know, fit, healthy. 
Um, we do, I, I loved uh, scuba diving, and I remember, you know, we'd, uh, we were there till 6 o'clock, but, you know, two nights a week, turn the phones over at 5 o'clock, go diving. Yep. It was an hour to, to Nelson Bay where we went diving, did a, an hour's dive, came back. So we got back at 8, half past 8, just picked up whatever calls. Where, um, did, you, where did you turn up, turn over the phones to in those days? A tape. Okay, right, <laughs> yeah. Tape deck, you know. Um, and, and so it was really... Uh, there were other practices in town, so they could ring someone else. Yep. Um, but it, it, but after 20 years, the life became hard and the life became a struggle. Um, what, what, what caused that change, that shift? I, I, I guess um, not having the money that I wanted to as a result of it, yep. um, seeing my relationship with my wife uh, drift apart because of the hours. She a, was a teacher and, and, and worked as well. Kids came along, um, not having the time to spend with them or do the things I wanted to. I, yep. I remember winning a holiday, a, uh, a, a, an all-expenses um, trip, and I, I can't remember it was Vanuatu or Fiji, 10 days by a, uh, it was one, uh, one of the wholesalers had it. I won it, could not afford to pay a locum to do the the 10 days that I wanted to be away. So we had to um, not accept the trip. And like, wow. <laughs> it, it, so everything started to build up, in, including, you know, just that sort of life pressure, life stress. The James Herriot thing became a little bit passe. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> after you've done a couple of carvings at midnight in rivers or whatever it happens to be, it, uh, don't, you don't really need to do it anymore. Don- donkeys um, grow old, as it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, we had dogs in the backyard changed to the hills hoist. Yeah. Um, for, for the people that are listening that don't know what a hills hoist is, it's a clothesline in the backyard because we didn't have, you know, decent kennels and yep. that yep. became a bit a bit ordinary after a while as well. Yep. So, uh, yeah, that whole James Harrier top situation just, just got to me eventually. Yep. So I thought I need to get out of this. As I said, I could see the industry changing with respect to what the Board of Vet Surgeons yes. wanted as minimum standards. Um uh, and, you know, we did good veterinary medicine. I'm not talking about minimum standards of care. I'm just talking about minimum physical standards. Yeah. Um, you know, our consulting room was also our surgery. So when we stopped consulting, we did surgery in that room. And when we um, stopped surgery, moved the table out, the surgery table out and consulted. I mean, that's how small the place was. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, so now we're sort of, you know, we've headed to this sort of decision point and had your, um, you know, had your decision making processes changed by this point? Um, like, you know, you, you initially, it's like, I'm coming out of college, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to get into this practice because that was, you know, almost like the pathway was set for you there. You, you know, you mm-hmm. sound almost mm-hmm. like you're not driving at that point. Well, now, yep. now there's a decision that you're, you're seeing things come under pressure things aren't aren't headed the way that you, you want them to and you, and you make you make a decision um what what were the you know what, what were the considerations at that point and um and what took you down the route of the direction you went maybe the word megalomania comes to mind <laughs> D- expand <laughs> what of that bright shiny state-of-the-art <laughs> practice that that could win awards and yep. um and and all that sort of stuff so so look that's what we built you know we yep. built a, a hospital <laughs> um 1.1 million dollars uh for the hospital plus fit out plus land um uh and uh yeah we we moved into that grew very rapidly yep. um well beyond my capacity to to manage uh, the the practice at all um and that's when things really started to to crash for a couple of years okay so it's up and running it's been open for you know about three years and then i was going to say something snaps i suspect you're going to say that's not how it happened um but what was this you know this, the sequence of events that led up to the moment and the you know the oh you know, the pinnacle's really the wrong word to describe this, but, you know, the suicide attempt. How, how did you end up in that, in that space? In that look, it was the, 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 
last straw was really interesting, um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. But it was just stress, financial stress, um, stress with the kids, stress with my wife, uh, all, all those sorts of things, and, and obviously the money issues. But the uh, uh, and it's it's really interesting how um, small things uh, snap, and and um, I I have a. Um, uh, well, I, I had a whole heap of skin cancers and I had 30 or 40 removed all pre-malignant ones. And, yep. and there's another one cropped up on my ankle. Yep. And um, I, I was told I needed to have it off. And it really stressed me out because the previous ones had been horrendously painful. Yep. And um, so I was due to have surgery the next day. And I just walked up to the hospital, drove up to the hospital that night and uh drank Letha Barb, let's be blunt. Yep. Um, and and the, 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 the thing is, I did not want to have that surgery on that mole. Yeah, right. So that was, you know, the, that was the, you know, the out, but was like the, the, the bad bit of plaster that, you know, it's the little bit you see, that was the bit that triggered it. But the whole mm. heap, of, there was just a massive hammer behind it driving you through that hole. Oh, yeah, yeah. What... Um, why why is Diedrich Gelderman still here today? Why are we able to uh, have this conversation? Um well uh, they you know found me and my daughter missed me and found and and they went up to work and found me and uh, ended up in the um um intensive care at the Marder and then ended up in a in a um a psych ward and and had counseling and all those sort of bits and pieces and then uh, decided I just wasn't going to go there again that wasn't acceptable yeah and so uh you know i said enough is enough line in the sand and uh decided to you know give it the the two years and and make it work or or quit and um got coaching um and that worked really 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 well um uh, professional business coaches not 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 um not veterinary coaches yeah uh, and these guys really, really, really helped. Yeah. Um, hugely, I then um, took that information and made it vet specific, so that we could keep applying it in, in the practice. And and um, yeah, things just uh, got better and better, very, very, very rapidly. Before I move on, because I'd love to hear more about the coaching side of things. And before I move on, but you know, certainly anyone who who's been in the industry for more than five seconds and sometimes we're unlucky enough even at university um you know suicide's just a huge issue and and still mm. um seems to be quite a taboo issue um mm. so thank you for speaking so candidly about that um i had i had t two questions and one of them one of them comes back to a moment that i had and i, I don't want to you know, I don't want to sit and dwell on this for too long. It's a, it's a dark subject, and but mm. it's an important subject because we have this, you know, four times national average um, incidence rate of, of committing suicide. And certainly, I I, I I recall very vividly sitting around at a, at a conference um, I was speaking at with somebody I'd just met who I was certain was going to be a good friend, and I was, you know, and we we bonded very very quickly. And we're sitting around talking, and had a great night. And then you know, did his talks and I did my talks. And then next conference I go to, and he's not there. Um, and you know, speakers come and go, and they're always booked for the same event. So I, I didn't really think anything of it. And then the third conference in the year, I was sitting uh, chatting to uh, one of the organisers, and they said, you know, I, you know, I asked, you know, what happened to this chap, and um, and then they said, you know. He, he committed suicide. Now he was my age. Um, seemed to be outwardly enormously successful, really smart, um, and you know had a young child. Um, lots of things that you think would, you know, be you would not associate necessarily with with suicide. Yet it seems to be, you know, very very frequently the pattern that often it's the people who are extremely successful on the outside um, that it happens to. My question at the end of that rather long-winded um, piece was, did you see it coming? No, absolutely not. 
No idea at all. And if you, having been through the experience, because that's kind of the you know the scary thing about it, having been through the experience and reflected on it, is there anything? Were there any signs that you would now, you know, looking back at yourself then, would you or how would you intervene in that moment so as that you didn't get to that, or did you need to get to that to break through to the next thing? Well, I think I needed to go through that. Um, I am very much more self-aware now. I, I, um, and I, and I, I'll be honest. I, uh, I've never told anyone this, um, but I do struggle. Maybe not on a daily basis, but certainly on a regular basis. But I can actually see it happening now, and and therefore, um, you know, I'm not a medication or anything. I don't need that. Yep. Um, but I can monitor my thoughts and 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 uh, everything else, and say, okay, well, uh, I can see I can see myself going yeah. a little bit dark. Uh, let's yep. do something about it. And and um, I, what a lot of what I do now, working with other businesses or other and especially other vet practices, is I don't want to see people have to end up in the same situation that I was in. I'd like right. them to be able to make changes from a perspective of volition rather than um, um, desperation. You know, there's been several high profile successful suicide attempts in the US um, and Marty Becker who I'm sure mm. most people would yep. know um, came out and wrote a very, very moving piece about how mm. you know I think his father had actually committed suicide and he suffered from depression and it's such an, you know, it's one of those in, insidious things that I think the statistics are one in three people on the planet suffer from depression. Um, oh, wow. And again, it's a it's a huge taboo issue that that we we ought to be talking more about. And so, again, I would just say thank you for for sharing that. Um, oh, pleasure. pleasure. And um, yeah, and I, I I'm I'm interested then rather than dwelling on the you know uh, let's not dwell on the okay the you know the bits that happen. Let's talk about the strategies then, and that probably leads quite nicely into the coaching stuff, but what are the strategies that you deploy, not just to reverse when you're feeling slipping slipping below where you feel good, but to maintain and to, to build? Because, you, you, you know, again, you have this success, this energy, this passion that is incredibly infectious. How do you maintain that level of enthusiasm for what you do? And, and do you have any routines and things that you do to, to, to maintain that? I was really lucky that uh, at about that time or just after that time, I became really, really interested in NLP. Um, and are you NLP trained, Dave? I am sp- sort of. I'll, uh, sort of? Okay. If, if you ever interview me back, I'll, 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 um, I'll tell you what I mean by that. My, I had a coach uh, for the whole time I had my practices in Australia, and she was NLP trained. So yeah. I guess I was okay. learning yeah. by... <laughs> Uh, osmosis, perhaps more. Uh, osmosis, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that really changed my communication, both internal and external, and, and that's helped yep. me a lot. Um, uh, some people listening may not like to hear this, but I'm also a Tony Robbins fan. I became, and, and you know, I think Robbins is, has got, got both good points and bad points. Yep. Um, and, you know, I love a lot of what he does. Yep. Um, and, uh, did a lot of his stuff, <laughs> and um, also became, uh, I, I guess, a, a, um, I, I read and listen to CDs constantly, and, yeah. and they're typically all um, up uh, uh, self motivational and motivational type stuff like you know even even things like biographies from from steve jobs and and obviously uh, darren hardy I'm, I'm a fan of as well even though he's only come along uh, a lot more lately but yeah all that sort of stuff is what what keeps me ticking now so if you were to if you had to give um let's say uh, you know a client you were going to give them a book uh, of all the books you've yep. read, you know, over the last sort of six months, which one, which one would you gift, and why? Um, the one, there's two that I've read in the last uh, month, and and one is uh, Drive, uh, 
the, uh, the surprising truth about what motivates us by Dan Pink. And yeah. I've watched the video, of course, or the TED Talk quite a number of times, but not, never read the book or, or listened to the book. And I've got it as an audio book. And I found that, you know, fascinating just to get the more, more depth on, on that TED Talk. And the other thing is by Carol Dweck, a, a, a oh, yeah. book called Mindset, uh, The New Psychology of Success. Um, and yeah, I've j- only just finished that this week so um that's a great book they yeah they would be um huge tools in my tool belt now i think and you're allowed to gift audiobooks there as well <laughs> that's okay <laughs> <laughs> this is what you send them the interesting the, the, the tony robbins is a polarizing character right um mm. what do you think is awesome about what he does and what do you think is you know, what, what are the things you don't like so much? Or maybe tell, 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 like, to, tell them about Tony Robbins to start with. Well, Tony Robbins is, I don't know, six foot seven, <laughs> seven foot six, <laughs> ten foot, I don't know. He's a very big man. He's a colossus. Um, and, and, yeah, he's a, he's a motivational genius. And, and it is rah rah and it is hoopla and it is Americanized and everything else like that. But he does push your buttons and he does make you do things that you may not want to do and i mean that in a good way and and probably for 95 percent of people after they leave one of his conferences or seminars or whatever you want to call it um they revert to their previous behaviors but for certain people and i was one of them you know i i I kept doing what it was that i didn't want to do but what was good for me um you know self-awareness and uh, yep. self-discovery and all those sorts of things so so i was one of those people that that actually you know took it on board and and, and kept doing it and, and for that I, I i thank him um the the bad side is i i did see him on occasion in in live events really hammer a couple of people that that um didn't deserve it and i, I think he at some stage got a little bit too big for his own ego but i think the bulk of what he does he does altruistically um and he's definitely uh, a a change maker i'm going to move on a little now and um one of the things that i've always been uh it's always hit me about you and and you know i've 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 attended your um turbocharger veterinary practice event which was yep, yep, yep. awesome and you know I mean, thank I you just come to australia and i was just starting speaking and it was it was just a very powerful event and lots of amazing things there so you know i can speak very much from the heart when i say if you have the opportunity to do uh one of the turbocharged workshops with Derek, absolutely do that you'll you know you'll you'll pay thank back you. your entrance fee in seconds flat um I have absolutely no doubt um what I got an inkling of there, and and probably not you know full exposure to though, um, was, uh, and and I wonder if this had a, a hand in your turning what was a an, an you know effectively a, a you know, figurative noose around your neck, but not not so figurative. You'd had the breakdown. Now let's go. Okay, the, the, what's the phoenix from the from the ashes here? How how does this pan out from here, and how did you make that happen? At that um, point, it, it was all about me, um, yep. you know, and, and that's a double-edged sword. It, it was great to be needed and to have everyone wanting you um, uh, to make every sort of decision and et cetera, et cetera. But then at the, at the immediately opposite that, it was terribly ne- to be needed and wanted that much. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a real <laughs> conundrum. Um <laughs> Uh, it, it was just fantastic to to have everyone, you know. So it was like being a, a, a religious, um, you know, deity uh, the way everyone wanted you. And and yep. uh, but that doesn't help anyone. And and I then learnt that lesson, and then learnt to get out of the way and let other people do things. So we put in two practice managers, a lead vet who wasn't me, um, someone in charge of. Um, accounting and all those sort of things. So the first coach we had was was Gerber, Michael Gerber, or one of his um, associates. And we went through the Gerber system, and that took 12 months. And for me, that was horrendous, absolutely horrendous, because uh, I felt my baby was being stolen, and the baby was, of course, the 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 the, the practice. Yeah. Um, 
but it was a ch- it was something that had to happen and once that happened and I was over that um the whole practice ran so much better and I could just walk into my vet work work walk out uh, I didn't even run the team meetings um uh, one of the two practice managers ran the team meetings so that was a huge um change and and so that was systematizing them. I mean, the phones are answered consistently. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of, of one of the things that we woke up to. And uh, we, uh, when we um, went home at night, the phones were diverted through to an answering, uh, through to our, our mobiles or, or whatever. And, uh, yeah, that would have been the days when mobiles were just starting to come in. Yes. And... Um, uh, for the third time in a month, we woke. So, so one day at, at about one o'clock, we realised at uh, one p.m. we'd realised we haven't had a phone call into the building the whole. You know, we'd, we had seven phone lines. We woke up the fact that we haven't had a phone call all day, oh, and then we thought, bloody hell, the the um, the, no one's undiverted the phones, <laughs> and we thought unacceptable totally unacceptable so then we put an opening procedure in place so, so we realized that happened three times that month and we thought you know the the, the great thing would be to blame the receptionist of course it's yep. a stupid fault you know she can't remember to undivert the phones as well as open the safe take the money out you know do everything else she had to do plus the the waiting clients at the door you know clamoring to get in at seven thirty. Yep. so um now we decided to be a little bit more sensible that we did an opening procedure and a closing procedure um um, and, how and then did, obviously, how did you hmm? ensure that those things were then done? I just know the question on the lips of all the practice owners out oh. there is going to be. But yeah. so we give them the bit of paper. They still didn't turn the phones over. How do you how do you get them to move from A to B? Well, what most people make the mistake of, in uh, in my opinion, is they'll go up to the receptionist and say something like, uh, uh, you know, you stuffed up, you can't remember how to do the, the phones and get everything else right, here's a system you've got to follow, just make sure and I'll be checking on you, um, which is probably putting the cart way before the horse. Um, I was, at that stage, intelligent enough and it took me a long time to, to get to that stage, or aware enough might be better, <laughs> that, you know, that that these receptionists weren't doing this deliberately. <laughs> now, they were after the patient's best interest, the client's best interest, the practice's best interest. So if they weren't making it happen, it wasn't just they were too stupid or too negligent. It was just that it, there was too much for them to do. So, so we went back to square one and said, okay, everyone's involved, team meeting. How do we get this to happen? Uh, okay, what about we put a series of check boxes in place, you know, aligned with a tick box, and the receptionist can just tick the boxes. Uh, ladies, you know, what's what's the benefit of this? Oh, well, um, people won't be ringing other practices. We want the clients to come here because we believe we have the best standards of care. Patients are going to get the best treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So it was done from and, – and, and obviously it was done from that perspective that – everyone's going to benefit including us then it the compliance goes out the window you don't have to force them to comply and the the tick so they had a sheet with an opening and a closing procedure and tick boxes and they had to fill that in every day morning and night for two or three weeks until they had it in their heads um and it wasn't done to they weren't doing it because they were forced to doing it they were doing it because they understood that when that this made their life easier that they didn't have to commit it to memory um does that make sense Doug? so they were able to trust that the you know the, the checklist was the thing that you know here's the process but actually here's the here's the checklist and that's you and and you'd ask them to come up with the ideas, is that right? Like they, yeah, have, so I've got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You give them ownership, is that right? Yeah, that I'll right? give you. They they had ownership, and I'll give you another example of of something we did at the same time, which was um. Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. One was we decided that seven year old pets, you know, were senior and they deserved a, 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 a I'll say a different standard of care, and that involved, you know. Uh, talking to the clients about changes that start to happen and and uh, recommending blood tests and and things along those lines, and because the vets were consistently forgetting to do that, 
um, we as a group sat down and said, okay, let's make up a seven-year-old pet checklist. Yeah. And so each of those was in the exam room. And when we had a seven-year-old pet, we said to the clients, hey, look, uh, we need to start doing some things differently. Uh, so here's a checklist that you and I are going to go through together just to make sure that I've covered off all the bases and, and your pet doesn't miss out. And, and again, that made our lives easier. It made the pet's um, lives better and, and the client's got a better standard of care. And the impact, and you, did you go through the whole practice? I mean, being through, uh, for anyone who's not yeah. familiar with, with Michael Gerber's work, the, the e-myth, uh, and there's an e-myth, yeah. there's an e-myth veterinarian now, isn't there, with Pete, Pete Weinstein? Yes, Very good Pete Weinstein, yeah. Um, yep. uh, I like that book um, as well, um, worth a read. So uh, did you mm. go the whole enchilada and systematize everything? How far did you go with that? Yeah, well, it took us two to three years. We systematized uh, everything. Um, and look, as far as put the word everything in inverted commas, you know, 90% because you can't systematize everything. <laughs> yep. But we had a, a, a for example, um, we had um, a uh, everything became positions dependent. So we had a receptionist shift that started at 7, another one started at 8, another one started at 9, then there's one started at 12, there's one started at 3, and one started, I can't remember if it's 4 or 5. Yeah. Um, and so the 12 o'clock shift start, uh, it didn't matter who it was, you know, any one of the receptionists, whoever it was, or even it was a nurse on that day uh, that was doing reception work, um, they started the courtesy call. So we rang every client two days after their visit yep. uh, to see how they were going, and that was a shift allocation so this 12 o'clock person that came in started doing those calls uh, she went to lunch at three and then uh, uh, someone else came in at three um, and then that if whatever the 12 o'clock person hadn't finished the three o'clock person picked up and so that worked seamlessly because it was shift um, allocated not person allocated and that's where I think a lot of people make mistakes with systems they make them people dependent not 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 uh, shift dependent right so they hire people who've got the skills to do certain things and group them for that person. And then when they go on yeah. holiday, nothing actually gets done. Um, yeah. And so it doesn't, doesn't work. That then would feed into, you know, you're, you're then hiring on the basis of those um, skill sets as well that you define through your systems. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll give you uh, an example of how a higher receptionist, at least do the initial job, uh, yep. at least the initial, yep. will put an ad in. And we do this, I do this with my coaching clients. Um, one of them did it last week, actually. And um, we'll put an ad in the newspaper saying, um, uh, would you like to be the face of the business, you know? Uh, and the business, we don't say what the business is. We're looking for a motivated, energetic uh, person to be the face of the business. You know, these are going to be the hours. Um, you'll be working with a great team. And we feel put a few other positive things in there. And uh, the negative will be that, uh, you know, don't take this job for the pay because it's it's uh, not a great rate of pay. And that will literally be in there. Yep. Um Craig, and then they'll be asked to ring a, a certain number, uh, and typically it's a mobile, um, unregistered, between 12 and 1 on Tuesday and, you know, 1 and 2 on Thursday. So if they ring up at five minutes before saying, um, uh, I, I'm interested in the job, well, if you can't listen to the instructions which said ring between 12 and 1, if you're ringing at 5 to 12, well, you're not going to listen. If you're not listening now, you're not going to listen when you got the job, so no. Yep. Um, but but Craig had uh, 600 applicants in, cool. in that two-hour period. And it's basically a matter of like the way they sound in those first five seconds in the phone, on the phone uh, dictated whether they uh, got an interview or not. And that may be being very harsh, but that's how your clients judge your receptionist. Yeah, right. right. And with 600... <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to be going through a ten-minute conversation with each, right? <laughs> yeah, so so if they sound okay, they're told, okay, great, yeah, you're you're up for an interview. Um, by the way, you should know it's a vet practice. Um, but but that's the only time they that's the first time that's they hear that's a vet practice. That that's yeah, that system works really well. And then obviously they go on to you know be behaviourally interviewed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um. 
that sparks off the thought at the other end of the spectrum, you know, where you, you know, hear and you wonder if it's a belief-based thing that's becoming a reality of the lack of applicants for um, clinical experience, clinical positions. Um, you know, 600, 600 applicants for, for a, you know, a front of house team, you know, that's mm. typically where you're going to get big numbers. But certainly vets in Australia, um, vets in, uh, in the UK um, complain a lot of not being able to get hold of experienced nurses and vets. Is that something you think is a groupthink belief thing that's happening there? Like are practices starting to suffer from, you know, you know, you know, the shoes on the other foot kind of thing now. So if you're not going to be good at looking after us, then we're just not going to apply. Or do we have a problem somewhere downstream? Because we all know there are more veterinary hospitals opening up and producing more graduates. So, you know, is there a gap or is there a perception gap? What's your take on that? I believe there is a gap. I'm not 100% sure as to why. My gut feel with respect to nurses is they... Uh, they love animals, you know, we get so many work experienced people wanting to be work experienced people, um, you know, during high school and then uh, do their animal handling training and nursing training and everything else. And I think they they join us for three or four years. They, um, they uh, quickly realise that the industry isn't what they thought it was. They, 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 the leadership is not good. The work conditions are not good. The pay is not good. And within three or four years, they're um, burnt out with respect to they understand that if they want to pay for a house, get married, have a car um, and all those sorts of things and have a decent life, they're not going to be able to do it on a vet nurse's wage. Um, and, and so they find a, another um, another career path. I'm not sure whether that's correct, but that's my sort of take on it. One of your other big areas, big loves, certainly – one of the areas I've learned the most from you over the over the years is marketing. Um, and what would you say, what are the things veterinary hospitals are not doing right now that they really should be doing? I love marketing because it's the fastest way to grow the practice and, and, you know, everything, you know, starts and ends with, with marketing as far as I'm concerned. And it's the difference between... A, a normal practice and a practice that's extraordinary. It's it's just in marketing. Now, the thing is that um, marketing is everything you do, whether it's the appearance of the premises, the cobwebs in the corner or lack of cobwebs, the way the uniforms are, the name badges, the website, you know, every single thing is marketing. The biggest mistake that I see people make, and, and maybe we'll talk about two big mistakes, and and the first one is that they don't pay attention to all those little things, and it's what I call the ripples in a pond effect. You know, if the client sees the spider webs or the torn tacky posters, and they say, "Well, if you can't look after the posters, what sort of care is my pet getting out the back?" and that may not be a conscious thought, but it's certainly uh, uh, my belief that it's a, a an unconscious thought. And then the second biggest mistake uh, is that they concentrate on new client acquisition rather than client retention. Yep. Um, and, you know, studies, and you'd know these better than I would, you know, all the studies show that tiny increases in client retention, you know, 5 to 10% yep. give you huge increases in, in practice profits, you know, 50 to 100%. Yes. And, and, and yet I see people spending money trying to lure people in the door, people that they don't know whether they're A client, great clients or Cs or Zs. They just want to get everyone in the door. And in the meantime, they're really good clients are leaving saying, what about me? Don't you care about me? And I've been here for a while and the receptionist didn't even greet me by name last time I walked in. She didn't pat the dog, but there's this new client there and she's making a fuss about that person. And so those clients, you know, drift off and and again you you'd know better than i would that you know 60 to 70 percent of clients that leave any business you know leave because of uh you know perceived indifference um they they believe that you no longer care about them so one of the biggest focuses i have in marketing is putting things in place that um that 
make your existing clients feel wow and feel special. Hey, Dave, it's it's Diderik here from the vets. Fluffy, she's just out of surgery. Everything went really well. Relax, get on with your day. Um, see you at four o'clock when you pick her up or, you know, the, the nurse ringing two days after saying, hey, Dave, um, Dr. Diderik asked me to ring. Uh, you're in with Fluffy the other day having having that ear exam. He just asked me to check you're getting the meds in all right? Did he answer all your questions? Was there any questions you forgot to ask? Is the ear does the ear appear to be improving? And again, you'd know all all that better than I do. But those little things, you know, a, a, a welcome card in the mail, uh, you know, welcome to the practice, uh, a thank you for the referral phone call, um, uh, you know, just a regular newsletter or blog that goes out once every month or something like that. All those little things just, just. Bond clients, people, service levels all over the world in every industry are so ordinary. <laughs> it requires it requires very little, very little to to stand out and and be you know iconic. Um, uh, you know, you just got to be nice. That's all it is. <laughs> Sorry, I, I went off a bit. <laughs> no, oh, it's great. It's, I'm reminded of the old gag about the you know the the hikers in the wood that meet the bear, and you know one of them says, you know, oh god, we can't outrun the bear. And another one he gets down and gets his running <laughs> shoes on. He goes, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. And he's like, I'm not trying to run the bear. I'm just trying to outrun you. Outrun you. Yeah, it's that. Yeah. That's the game, isn't it? Um, yeah. At, at the very least, and uh, no, be nice. I laughed at be nice because that's that's one of the core values I have like scribbled on my wall. It's just that one oh, yeah. sentence. Just be nice. I think the world would be a lot better place if that was, you know, tattooed on 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 people's foreheads uh, or certainly on their forearms so they could see it uh, and remember that. I'm gonna I'm gonna kick some shorter form questions at you. Okay. Uh, just go go for the answers and uh, and um, and I I'll get and you can make them longer answers if you want to that's that's all good that's all good and um, you can name names or you can you know you can change names to protect guilt or innocent or whatever so I will, I'm going to give you kind of a, not enough rope to hang yourself with but enough uh, freedom to sort of you know take 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 this where you will so the, okay what was the best piece of advice you've ever given or received you choose. Or both. God, gee, I wish you'd have framed me up with this ahead of time. Best advice. Um, I, 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 I think the best piece of advice ever received, um, and it was the the worst piece or the most horrible piece at the time was that client that said to me, "You're a great vet, but you're an asshole of a person," because <laughs> um, it it made me look at myself and and. Uh, it, it, because I respected him because he was such a, a good, consistent client and because it was such a slap in the face, it, uh, yeah, it, uh, had a, it achieved its uh, effect. That maybe answers all of the questions at once. So the next one is going to be, what's the worst <laughs> piece of advice you've ever given or received? So you can, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe you swatted It'll, that one away uh, already. Yeah. Um, what's the best gift you've given or received and why? Um, the best gift is the NL, my first NLP training. I didn't want to go, but, uh, Jennifer, my partner did. Yep. And so she made, made me go. And that was a, a real turnaround in, uh, my life. What, what did it, what did it, um, I'm sure people are kind of fascinated. We've sort of, we've just sort of skirted around NLP and it's, it's a huge topic, but give, give me the. You know the zeitgeist of what that's about and why NLP uh, neuro linguistic training uh, developed by Bandler and Grinder in the the seventies. Um, uh, mechanic for the mind, if you like, um, is probably a nice simple way to put it. It 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 shows you, and one of the big things I like about NLP is it teaches you how to model. So if anybody's ever achieved anything, then anybody else can also achieve any, achieve any, that same thing if you just follow the exact same processes that that are, that first person's used. So I, I love modelling and and being able to do things that other people do by just essentially copying or mimicking or um, whatever you want to call it. So that that's a, a great tool from NLP plus languaging, um, how to use your language to 
uh, motivate uh, yourself and 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 other people and and tied into that too is body language I'm fascinated by body language I'm actually doing my body language trainers training uh, at the moment I'm in week three um, so so those those are fantastic tools if anybody wants to learn them so never never assume that a conversation with with Diedrich is just a conversation <laughs> <laughs> he's looking into your soul <laughs> and I'm quite possibly not even lying there or joking um, if um, you recommend it, you give me the books already I'm, f I'm wondering if there's a book that would be we've talked a lot about management and leadership but perhaps you know you've, you've this, this um, duality of purpose whereby you, know, you, you love the, the business side of it but mm. can't leave the medicine side of it behind. Mm. I feel that entirely in my life as well. Mm. Mm. Um, are there any books that have affected you on the clinical side that you think that that just that blew me away, that changed me? Uh, look, I'm a surgical nut. Um, <laughs> we did a lot of high-end surgery at Green Hills, you know, um, uh, TTAs, T pillows, you know, uh, s spinal uh, surgeries. Um, um, all sorts of stuff. So any any book on surgery, especially ortho, um, it, it, I'm passionate about. You're loving that. Are there any tools or apps that you're using right now that you think are are just awesome that that, that people should try try out, take for a spin, and and if so, which ones and why? Why are they good? I'm not I'm not a a real techie junkie uh, one of uh, one of the things i'm interested in or, or that's working really well i i um have a workshop that i ran in 2016 that will be running again shortly in march and one of the guys in that course um mike mesley he uses the WhatsApp app, I think that's how yep. you pronounce it. Yep. And so. he he introduced us to that at the workshop and then um, that's really kept the group, you know, together as it were for the six months uh, of the course and after the course. So that was that's been a really interesting learning experience. I'm pretty it's interesting you say that. I, I had a um, conversation with a uh, with one of the practices I, I have and um and they've just been using that. They're talking about ways of um, engaging with the client without um, having to, you know, give out your mobile phone number. Mm -hmm. um, and they're taking dental photographs and then ah. sending them in their, you know, because clients will walk in and they'll go, "Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. they'll definitely do it." And then they definitely disappear. And then, you know, next year they come in and they're, they're yeah. got ten more teeth falling out. And using them to send those images to clients and having some interesting small numbers like n equals four or five but you know interesting sort of responses where where they were hitting walls before so it's interesting okay. to mention that but yeah. um if you could give yourself one one piece of advice back at graduation and i'm going to ask this of every person i interview it's not just set up for you given you did something pretty out there when you graduated um and it doesn't necessarily have to relate to that if you could give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, I'm going to use, I'm going to steal your words, be nice. I wasn't very nice for the first 20 years of my career. Uh, I was too up myself. Um, I knew I was a good vet and, you know, um, and I think you've got to be honest about that uh, just as a sideline. I think you've got to know whether you're good or, or, or not good. And 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 I was uh, very competent uh, but I wasn't a very nice person so yeah I'll steal your words how how does one cultivate self-awareness because at that you know when you're young self-awareness is not always that you know it's certainly not the strongest suit in a lot of you know driven task focused people who wind up owning or running veterinary practices or just people who had to be task focused and pretty driven to get into vet college in the first place mm. um and then we you know we're, we're sat up on these pedestals we're always told we're awesome and then we get out there and we hit the world and sometimes wheels fall off how how are there any ways that that you found that you you've managed to cultivate a, a self-awareness build that self-awareness as the start point to to change um, Other than for me, clients telling yeah. you you were, you were 
you're, you're a horrible person. <laughs> or is that it? Uh, that helped. Um, <laughs> look, the, the NLP and the body language training uh, helped me a lot. Yep. Um, and obviously going through divorce, um, going through the breakdown and, and all that sort of stuff, that was a really um, uh, a pivotal. And, and the Dave... The Dave, we, the book we talked about, mindfulness, um, by uh, Carol Dweck. Yeah. Uh, like you know, like I said, I read that this month or last month. Uh, we're now in February, um, yeah. and um, it was hugely eye-opening with respect to um, self-assessment. For the person who doesn't, you know, doesn't have access to the computer, is listening to this on uh, on a device. I will post notes or links to everything that we talk about as we um, go through right. the interviews. So I'll I'll post like some notes associated with the with the podcast um, mm. and links to it from there. So don't worry too much if if you if you want to go back and look at that, I'll post them on the site. So that'd be fine. Um, so Dick, what what is it you are grappling with or working on? Like, what's the number one thing on your to do list right now? What's happening in your life? I guess what I just talked about a, a couple of minutes ago, which is the um, the easy veterinary marketing course that um, uh, well we start marketing for it in about ten days, and then the course starts on the first Monday in March. So um, that I'm just finalising all the last bits and pieces uh, from last year's course. So um, that's what that's my major grappling point at the moment what um i'm now is that is that an online course or is that something i'm like every time i hear you're doing something i feel like i should get on a plane and go and attend so how you know is that <laughs> um, is it online is it offline is it what's the what's the format of that and what what can people like what will people get by doing that uh let's make a really simple summary uh the idea is you get 30 percent practice growth rate and and maybe not all practices will achieve it but the bulk of practices in from the 2016 course achieve that 30 percent um pa growth rate on top of what you're doing now so that's a, an awesome outcome it's uh a, an eight month course i work with everyone one-on-one -on -one. it's a small group course 25 only practices um it, it is all online except for a face-to-face -face workshop so there's a three-day face-to-face workshop and this is why I keep it to 25 practices in a in a small group event like that I can work with all the practices including at the face-to-face -face. larger group I can't do that so um, and the face-to-face fa -face is in Australia well um, I'm looking at having one overseas as well for, I had a lot of uh, I had a mixture of people last year. There was South Africans, Americans, and Australians, and and a couple of the uh, overseas people came to the Sydney workshop. So I might even run two workshops: one in Sydney and one overseas. Um, the look, a anyone that didn't attend last year, uh, sorry, er the everything's recorded, one hundred percent, totally completely recorded, including the including the workshop. So the um, the attendees that couldn't make the workshop last year. Uh, watch the uh watch the uh the recordings um but yeah with with some luck we'll have two workshops this year cool i think you'd run them both in sydney having just moved away from there to <laughs> from australian winter to uk winter i'm like i'd get back on a plane to sydney in a heartbeat if, and if you've not been then it's an amazing opportunity to go where your airline ticket's going to be taxed you know, tax yeah. refundable, and yeah. you're gonna learn something. And uh, and, uh, and twenty twenty five percent on the dollar too, like for the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> it's an in, it's an in, it's an insanely good time to to visit Australia. That's for for absolute sure. Um, if you I, wait, my last question for you, and I don't know if you use Twitter, so you can um, you can adapt this. But I, I want to leave people with you know a last thought kind of thing. If you could send one tweet and the world could see it, so it's got to be under 140 characters. What what would you what would you want that tweet to say? Uh, I was going to be a, a smart ass and say, you know, come to the uh, Easy Veterinary Marketing <laughs> Workshop. 
Um, <laughs> but you'd know that that wouldn't be so niche, and you know the whole world seeing it. And <laughs> no, um, my um, yeah, I'm just thinking. Like my passion is is pets and people, and I think a lot of pets get a get get the short end of the stick, and and a lot of people do as well, and they don't deserve it. So I I try and fashion something. Um, around that, maybe, maybe, um, maybe care more for for pets and people or something like that would be my tweet. We're coming back to being nice, aren't we? Yeah. Look, I hate, absolutely hate seeing animals, you know, mistreated either deliberately or or inadvertently. Um, and and I do anything I can to to help ameliorate that. Derek's. Uh absolute pleasure speaking to you if people want to get in touch about your marketing course or just anything else as i say i'm very i'm appreciative of your time i'm appreciative of your candor and and um and some really interesting stuff we've covered there um so i'm happy to um happy to say you know whether it's this course or whether it's any of dick's course you you really wouldn't find it a poor investment i'm certain of that where can where can guys reach you um how do they get in touch uh, thank you it was a, a pleasure um thank you for inviting me Pro- probably the easiest uh, i've got a number of email addresses but the easiest one would be my full name and, and then at, at gmail.com so d i e d e r i k g e l d e r m a n at gmail.com that's probably the quickest way to reach me and if, if anybody's interested in the course um yeah just email me and i'll let you know when uh, when you can register brilliant thank you so much for your time Diedrich. Um appreciate it all the best and I hope I catch up with you next time over in Oz thank you and I'll catch up with you in the in the UK thanks Dave brilliant so thanks for listening again to the podcast hope you enjoyed it you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Dave Nickel on Facebook facebook.com forward slash Dr. Dave Nickel and you can check out my website which is www.drdavenickel.com and read the hamster wheel there thanks again